monitoring devices. I'm Xavier Monet. I work in, in Paris, in one of the Paris University hospitals. And uh, I have the following conflicts of interest to disclose. I collaborate with Palchon Medical Systems, Göttinger, that develops uh, some of the uh, monitoring devices we're going to speak about, and uh, with uh, Baxter uh, as well. We can think about that very practically, a patient with uh, community-acquired pneumonia who was uh, hospitalized because of uh, fever, cough, dyspnea, rapidly increasing. The diagnosis uh, was rapidly established of respiratory failure, and uh, you see that initially the blood pressure was uh, 110 and uh, 40 milliliters of uh, mercury, and the third number is the mean arterial pressure. There was acidosis and a high, uh, not acidosis, but low bicarbs and um, uh, hypoxemia. And as soon as the patient was intubated, you see that blood pressure went down, very low blood pressure, uh, 60, 34 milliliters of mercury, and the patient was slightly tachycardic. And at that time, we knew this was community-acquired pneumonia with inflammatory um, syndrome, and the patient, so at that time, was intubated. The question we are going to answer in the next uh, minutes is uh, which hemodynamic monitoring do we need to this patient, for this patient? And in fact, there are many questions that will be uh, that will arise in such a patient. And likely, the initial questions are, what is the type of shock? It's likely the first one. Should we start the initial treatment? Should we start the vasopressor? Of course, we will start fluid. But should we start vasopressor at which dose? When? And as I said, what is the, the shock profile? The key point here is likely the importance of arterial pressure. I mean that I, I think one often missed the importance of blood pressure, because blood pressure, which is like the most important hemodynamic variable we have under our eyes, contains a lot of hemodynamic information. But not only the mean arterial pressure, all the numbers are important. Among you who measures the systemic or calculates the systemic vascular resistance in his or her practice, SVR, who is used to measure it in such a patient? Nobody measures the systemic vascular resistance? How do you decide to insert these uh, uh, nor epinephrine in this patient. Which variable do you look at? Who wants to answer? You say the diastolic blood pressure, and likely you're right. Because the diastolic blood pressure is physiologically related to the arterial tone. And that's very important because it means, and it is a pure marker of arterial tone not vascular tone, but arterial tone. It is also influenced by heart rate, but besides heart rate, the only determinant is, is vasomotor tone, much better than the systemic vascular resistance. And the arterial pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastolic is related to stroke volume. It means that when looking at the uh, hemodynamic, uh, at the arterial pressure profile, we know whether it's septic shock with a low diastolic blood pressure and a preserved pulse pressure, while typically a cardiogenic shock or hypovolemic shock profile is associated with a higher diastolic blood pressure and smaller pulse pressure variation. So when I go to the emergency room facing such a patient, I already have a lot of information regarding the shock profile. And by the way, as you suggested, the diastolic blood pressure is a good indication to start norepinephrine when, it, when it's very low, typically below 40 milliliters of mercury. It likely means that 
I should start norepinephrine. And that's likely the first message to bear in mind. Blood pressure contains, sorry for the typo, a lot of hemodynamic information provided that all the numbers are taken into consideration. Nevertheless, um, um, we need likely more than that. Because one of the questions that will be asked in this patient, that will arise in this patient, is cardiac output. And here the main question is, should we monitor cardiac output in this patient? Because if we do not monitor cardiac output, I mean that one will only look at the bedside monitor. For instance, if you give fluid to this patient, you agree that you will change cardiac output. Basically, fluids are aimed at changing cardiac output. But when you give fluid, which variable do you look at? When you give a fluid bolus, what do you look at for knowing whether it was efficient or not? Who wants to answer? Raise your hand and turn on your microphone with a red button. Speak out in there, yes. Well, CVP. You mean? Um, I, I would use CVP as a marker of preload, of adequate preload, given the, the bone, the fluid bone. Good point, because you use CVP as a marker, and it is a very good marker of right cardiac preload. It may tell you, by the way, the tolerance of fluid infusion, but it does not tell you whether cardiac output increases or not. When you give fluid, it is basically for increasing cardiac output, not CVP. You increase the pulse pressure? So you will increase the pulse pressure. We just said that when I give fluid, when, when, uh, the, I, we just said that stroke volume is reflected by pulse pressure. You're right, but... What is obvious from physiology is that pulse pressure measured at the peripheral level, because we do not access the aortic pulse pressure, of course. It is related to stroke volume and cardiac output, obviously. It is determined by cardiac output. But it's also obvious that it is determined by what's between the aortic valve and the peripheral artery. I mean the arterial system. Compliance. Resistance. And the problem is that in such a patient's resistance will change. And so it will change from physiology the relationship between the pulse pressure, the surrogate of stroke volume, and stroke volume itself. So the question is, is it really a big problem? I mean, is it really true that if arterial resistance change, changes, we change the relationship between pulse pressure and stroke volume. This is what we investigated in this very simple study. In some patients, we gave fluid, a fluid bolus. So we did not change resistance, roughly. Look, there was a correlation between the true cardiac index here and pulse pressure, as you suggested. But it was a rough correlation. In some patients, pulse pressure did not change that much. Cardiac output increased by more than 100%. So it's a rough correlation. By the way, in some other patients, we increased the dose of norepinephrine, and you see, not surprisingly, there was no correlation anymore between pulse pressure and stroke volume. It may mean that in these patients who receive vasopressors, these patients where arterial resistance will change, one needs to measure cardiac output directly. Just looking at pulse pressure will be a very rough surrogate. Pulse pressure. Look at this study here in Brussels by the team of Jean-Louis Vincent and Daniel de Bakker at that time. They gave a fluid bolus, assessed pul pulse pressure, as you said. There was no correlation between the concomitant change in 
cardiac index, no correlation. Again, in complex patients, where you want to know what happens, you need to measure cardiac output directly. It may be true from the emergency room level, okay, already at, the, at that time. And that's just because, again, there is something between the artery and the heart, which is the arterial system. So, it may mean that one should monitor cardiac output directly, whatever the way, in complex patients. Many colleagues may say, oh, I don't need to do that. For years, I just look at blood pressure and my patients do not die more than the other ones. Okay, but it is, by the way, recommended, okay? This recommendation of the European Society in 2014 suggested to, re to measure cardiac output and stroke volume not in all the patients, but in patients who are not responding to initial therapy. It may mean patients who, does not, who do not respond to initial fluid and small doses vasopressors. So perhaps if we have a septic shock on urinary tract infection, okay, we know these patients rapidly improve with fluid, sometimes a low dose norepinephrine. Perhaps we don't need to monitor cardiac output in these patients indeed. But in such a patient with complex, serious shock on pneumonia, perhaps with cardiac dysfunction, with ARDS, we need to know more, and that implies measuring cardiac output directly. By the way, we are updating this consensus conference, and the results will be published um, in next, um, during the next uh, European Congress in Milan. Something else, so there is an initial monit basic monitoring, which is made of arterial pressure. By the way, definitely we need an echo assessment at that time, and that's very important because we will not treat the patient in the same way if the ejection fraction is 20 or 60, okay? Always, every day, everybody says, yes, we need an initial echo, but in practice, you see that. I see that some of you pointed out that, uh, in fact, the echo is not really normal, okay? There is a, likely a scar of myocardial infarction here. You see the thickness of the, uh, there is no thickening of the septum here, and there is a hyperechoic structure here, which is likely a scar of myocardial infarction. The global ejection fraction is normal, but it may not always, it may not always be the case. And so we need an initial echo in this, in this patients. But if the patient does not improve with initial treatment, we need to see more, and in particular, to monitor cardiac output at least. I think that today we have some proof in the literature telling us that we need to see more. Okay, but uh, with which devices? So, and that likely it is a, a, a second important message. We need to, we should monitor cardiac outputs, measure, monitor, uh, measure cardiac output directly in ICU patients who resist to initial treatment. Blood pressure monitoring is not enough in this patient, and again, this is demonstrated in the literature. Which device? Because today we have many devices on the shelf. Um, among you who in daily practice uses transpulmonary thermodilution, I mean the PICO from Belgium, the hemosphere, who uses the PA catheter? You work in cardiac units, not perhaps, because it remains very popular. I don't work in a cardiac unit, and I use the PA catheter. I, should, I could raise my hand, by the way. Who uses uncalibrated pulse contour analysis? Vigileo, Pulsioflex, in the ICU as well, or in the OR? I see you, okay. Bioreactants, Starling device, you know what it is? And do you know what is finger cuff measurement of cardiac output, what's called volume clamp? CNAP or ClearSight, same system. 
And in fact, all devices are not the same. And this is, uh, I think, an important method for practice and for deciding which device, which device you buy for your unit. Invasive devices, the old PA catheter transpulmonary thermal dilution, minimally invasive devices, I mean esophageal Doppler, it's not for the ICU, I think, because the probe moves in the patient, and calibrated pulse control analysis, and today we have many devices, all the new um, attractive non-invasive devices finger cuff or volume clamp devices on bioreactants. And what I want to show you in the next slides is that these non-invasive or minimally invasive devices are not for the ICU patients. For two reasons. The first is that they are not reliable enough. Uncalibrated pulse control analysis, you know, it's based on the fact that if you have the arterial pressure uh, and a software can analyze the, the, f the waveform, so pulse contour, it means arterial pressure curve. And from this waveform, you estimate stroke volume. Because the amplitude of the systolic part and the waveform is related to stroke volume. And with these uncalibrated devices, you make an initial calibration. And by the way, after this initial calibration, the, the point is that you have a beat-by-beat -beat estimation of stroke volume. So it's good because you have a cardiac output value that changes from second to second on the screen. It's continuous. Nevertheless, these devices are not reliable again when the resistance changes. If the resistance changes, the arterial resistance changes, you easily understand it will change the waveform. And it will make this uncalibrated estimation unreliable. It has been demonstrated with many studies, by many studies, and uh, especially for the Vigileo device, but it's the same for the other ones, likely. I show you just some illustrative studies among the, the number we have. This percentage of error, whatever it is, should be below 30% to indicate reliability. It's good. In normal SVR patient, much higher if the resistance changes, obviously. Another very illustrative figure in an article during liver surgery, you know, during liver surgery, the arterial tone changes to a large extent. The, the, the smaller the resistance, so the more dilated the patients are, the higher the bias. It's written here. These devices are not for patients under vasopressors with sepsis. Unfortunately, because you can just plug them on a, on a classical standard arterial catheter, okay? Non-invasive devices. These are the very uh, uh, attractive, and by the way, uh, uh, volume clamp devices, by the way, very clever way to estimate cardiac output. You have cardiac output just from a ring around the finger. And within this ring, there are two things. There is an, um, a pneumatic cuff that is surrounding the, the, the finger, and there is a plat sensor, which measures, which, which measures uh, oxygenated hemoglobin. It means it measures the, um, the uh, diameter of the finger arteries. Okay? And at each time, the arterial pressure increases, the cuff inflates to maintain the diameter of the finger arteries constant. Okay? And at each time, so there is a saddle motor inside that inflates and deflates with the arterial pressure. So the principle is that the pressure inside the cuff is related to the finger pressure and the software estimates the arterial pressure in this way. It's a clever way to, smart way to assess uh, arterial pressure. And on the top of that, there is pulse contour analysis that in, from this arterial pressure curve estimates cardiac output. So cardiac output just with a, with a, a finger cuff here. It's indeed non-invasive. 
and we have some devices, the Synap device, uh, the ClearSight device of Edwards. Is it reliable? These are the st if we look at this meta-analysis, uh, reviewed here by um, Antonio Messina, the percentage of error on average is 43, so higher than 30. If you look into details, you have some studies with a good percentage of error. They were conducted before surgery in normal subjects, and you have bad percentages of error conducted in ICU patients. And you easily understand that a patient with vasopressor in the ICU, there is a bad PLET signal, a bad measurement of pressure and cardiac output. These devices are not for ICU patients. Bioreactants. A new device, it's called uh, Starling by Baxter. Uh, current is sent to the thorax through just four electrodes. So, indeed, completely non-invasive. And the principle is that the difference in phase between the inward and outward current tells you the volume of the thorax. And this difference in phase is called reactance. So it is bioreactants. And from beat to beat, the volume of the thorax changes because of the aortic volume. So it is stroke volume that, it, in fact, it measures. That's the way you have stroke volume. It's multiplied by heart rate, and you have cardiac output totally non-invasive way of measuring cardiac output. So it's very attractive, but the problem again is that it's not for ICU patients. And the validation studies again showed that good studies were performed before surgery or in stable patients after surgery, in pregnant women, healthy subjects. The bad studies were conducted in much more unstable patients major surgery, liver transplantation, again. Not only these devices are less reliable, but also they provide less information. And it means that I think, it's my point of view, there is an indication for the operating room, non-cardiac surgical patients, high-risk surgical patients for non-invasive or minimally invasive devices, and an indication for the advanced sophisticated devices in ICU patients. And we are left with the PA catheter and the transpulmonary thermodilution devices. In the OR, that's correct, okay? They are less or non-invasive, and of course you don't need an invasive device for hip replacement therapy in an old uh, patient. They are cheaper, they provide less information, but the anesthesiologist likely needs less information. In the ICU, you use some more expensive devices, invasive devices, but they are more informative. And indeed, the, and that's the third message, these two types of devices, transpulmonary thermodilation, PA catheter, are the recommended devices for this purpose. They are reliable and provide more information. And indeed, many more questions will arise in such a severe patients. You do not need only, only to show the need for fluid. You need to know what is cardiac output, is it adequate to tissue um, a re oxygen requirement, should I give fluid, should I not give fluid, what is the right ventricular function in case of many questions that arise in such patients. Uh, I think that only the most invasive devices can assess and answer all these uh, questions. Cardiac output is measured by both types of devices in a reliable way. It's thermodilution with a PA catheter. So you inject a cold bolus and you obtain cardiac output, but it is intermittent. The semi-continuous measurement is a near reflection of the last 5-10 minutes, okay? It's not beat-by-beat beat estimation. With transpulmonary thermodilution devices, you need a standard venous catheter and a semester tipped catheter. So, uh, an arterial catheter, usually femoral, with a semester. And the same when you inject a cold bolus, it measures cardiac output. But again, it is intermittent, exactly as the PA catheter. 
But the big advantage of these devices is that on the top of that, you have calibrated pulse counter analysis. And so the big difference between the PA catheter and transpulmonary thermal ocean devices is that these devices measure cardiac output with a continuous estimation, which is, by the way, very precise. It's calibrated, and so it's a big advantage compared to the PA catheter. So it means that, especially for assessing um, a preload responsiveness with a test, passive leg raising, etc., that's a good point for uh, transpulmonary thermal dilution devices. Um, regarding the tissue oxygenation, the advantage is for the PA catheter. And the only way to reliably estimate SVO2 or the PCO2 derived indices is the same, it is with the PA catheter. You remember the old studies published on that, and there is no doubt on that. That's a big advantage for the PA catheter. Cardiac preload, pressure estimation with a PA catheter, PAOP, volume, volumetric estimation, so it's the global in diastolic volume, and the principle, so you know the PAOP, the old PAOP from the catheter, with transpulmonary thermodilution, a combined analysis of the thermodilution curve and its logarithmic transformation provides the estimation of many fluid volumes of the thorax, including this volume of the four cardiac chambers. With um, the, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, regarding the risk of excessive fluid administration, the advantage is for these devices because they directly estimate lung water and permeability. And it's, in theory, a better assessment of the risk of uh, fluid administration. Better than PAOP. You estimate the volume of lung edema, which is a more direct estimate of the risk of giving fluid, especially in ARDS patients. Better than with the PAOP. Regarding the, um, and likely better than the PF ratio, we don't insist on that. Regarding the right ventricular function, definitely it's a big advantage for the PA catheter. It's the only way you can measure the PVR, the pulmonary vascular resistance. And the, the very last recommendations regarding pulmonary hypertension still recommends the PA catheter for measuring it, not echo again. And finally, both devices will measure the contractility uh, uh, estimate indirectly the contractility of the, uh, of the uh, left ventricle, decrease in cardiac output, decrease in PAOP with uh, the PA catheter, decrease in what's called the global ejection fraction with the PICO. Uh, with the PICO, you, you have an estimation of uh, stroke volume and global and diastolic volume. It's not very different from the LV ejection fraction. So the reference is echo, but just by doing a thermodilution, you have a good estimate of um, the contractility that will tell you you should perform an echo. So you see that one may find some advantages for this or for that. I think it is today absolutely possible to monitor a patient with a PA catheter. I know it's not very fashion, but I think it is still possible, provided you know how to use these devices. And it's likely easier with these devices of transpulmonary thermal dilution than with a PA catheter, which requires more skill to interpret all the variables. If all these devices are not available or contraindicated, perhaps you may use ECHO. But for me, ECHO is not a monitoring device. How many ECHOs are you going to perform in this patient in the first day? One, two, not more, okay? And so it's who performs echo before, after fluid infusion. So it's not a monitoring device. It's an intermittent assessment, which is very useful. And so, uh, and uh, the, the last message, I'm sorry, is uh, the PA catheter and transpulmonary thermodilution may answer all the questions that arise in such patients with uh, severe circulatory failure, especially
the PA catheter in case of right ventricular dysfunction and transpulmonary thermodilution for performing fluid responsive test tests. Thank you very much for your attention. Time for a short, very short question.